Hello and welcome to On Landscape. We're here uh, in a, uh, at the end of a hot spell of weather in the Highlands. Uh, I'm sitting with uh, Joe Cornish, uh, who's very kindly come up to visit and helped me putting a roof on the shed, as well as doing some photography. All good fun. Yes. Yeah. Um, and as we have done in the past, we're going to take a look at some of the work that Joe's done since we last looked at his work, which was autumn last year. Um, and I believe we're going to be looking at some lakes and some Cornwall. Lakes in Cornwall and um, workshops. Uh, so lucky for me yeah. uh, and uh, particularly lucky to meet up with my oh, very good friend, David Ward, uh, for the Lake District one. Yeah. So we're going to start for this uh, episode with Cornwall. Uh, and when were you down there and whereabouts were you travelling? So this was at the end of April and the beginning of May uh, with uh, Anthony Spencer. Uh, uh, we had four days in Bude and then uh, then I had a, a workshop on my own uh, in Land's End after that at Land's End. So lovely, lovely time of year to be in Cornwall. Uh, the wildflowers are abundant on the clifftops and the weather was incredibly pleasant. Um, variations of, of cloud and sunlight mainly. Uh, some some quite overcast days as you can see yes yeah. uh, a, good, and a good mix with yeah everything. very nice mix and um it was yeah just uh, lovely people uh what's not to like okay where, where, where do you want to start then the first picture then the well Bude, yeah we're starting with Bude. so the the first one this is uh, strangles which is uh, actually right on the cornwall devon border yeah. north of Bude. Uh, and it's, I beg your pardon, it's not Strangles, it's Sandy Mouth. Sandy Mouth. Sorry about that. Strangles is a little bit further south, nearer uh, to Crackington Haven. So Sandy Mouth, um, some people may recall a few months back, the BBC broadcast a, uh, a cliff collapse from here. Yes. Uh, which was, you know, on their weather page, but it yeah. was just incredibly dramatic. And it just shows that this, these sorts of cliffs, however immutable, and powerful and and timeless they look they're actually geology in action all the time and i have to say that over the 20 years or so that i've been visiting sandy mouth i've seen enormous changes yeah the north atlantic doing its work absolutely the power of the ocean is just yeah it is relentless and uh, you know i think it, it's something that it's just worth mentioning at this point that when you work at these in these locations especially uh, when the not necessarily just when the tide is coming in, but where you know look at look at the sea here, it, it couldn't be more bland on on the face of it. But we still had we were still working on the edge of the water here, and there was still one occasion when a so-called freak wave came in. And I had to get everybody to lift their tripods, yeah. and many people ended up with Wellington boots full of water. Oh, that high, yeah. Um, so yeah. These freak waves that aren't so freak, essentially, aren't they? Exactly. They're just a uh, com you know, they, they're com combination of, of wind. And uh, yes, when a swell combines in a particular way, uh, it's accumulated energy from, mm. from waves uh, essentially converging. I think most of us who've worked on the coast have experienced it at one time or another. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it should be said, the same goes for cliffs, uh, cliff edges. If you're working around cliff edges, be very wary when it's been raining for a long time saturated cliff edges tend to collapse. That's a very good point. It's actually the dampness uh, that, that's often the main agent of change rather than, um, you know, a, you might imagine cliffs collapsing with storm undercutting and that is certainly also true, but it usually it's down to the internal dampness of the rock. Sometimes a bit of freeze thaw involved, which is why yeah. um, you know that winter can be more susceptible. But I, know, anyway. I know this from being, being at uh, Whitby. Um, and standing near to the um, on the beach just down from Whitby, where it falls apart on a regular basis. Yeah, Solwick. Solwick, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very, and very a couple, of, a couple of scares there. But anyway, Sandy Mouth, it doesn't look that uh, dangerous today, apart from the odd wave. No, um, uh, no, it's, it was wonderful. Um, so as as you can see, the uh, the light here, the light, the lights, uh, sun is behind cloud. Um, and I, I've done almost nothing to this, Tim. There's a, there's a little layer on here. What's it doing? It's just really pulling the highlights back in the sky. So I haven't really started, I've barely started work on this. Uh, that's just about enough to pull the highlights back. And actually looking at it, uh, I'm thinking, well, perhaps that sheen on the water 
um, isn't completely consistent now with the sky so wondering if I should indeed uh, be adding to um, uh, the the highlight I would imagine it is a highlight adjustment it isn't actually that's interesting so uh, no I beg your pardon let's go to the layer and indeed we see that it is a highlight uh, addition so this is highlight recovery yeah in capture one it's a little bit of shadow as well the reason I've done that by the way and we just uh, put the mask on we can see that it covers the cliff as well yes the reason I've done that is because I was looking to also lift the cliffs and that essentially it's what you might call the application of aerial perspective if I turn that off for a second we can see the cliffs go a bit darker yes yeah so it and it's sort of it's essentially it's drawing the eye more I, I would hope more out there into the into the space balancing the space but I do think that probably I should add a little bit of highlight recovery into here so I'm going to do that by just checking we use a lower flow and I can just uh, should just be able to paint in just a bit more yeah. light recovery mainly in there so that that is now just slightly so darker uh, than uh, the than the sky yes. which show uh, uh, relationships yeah look natural I think my I, I, rather than labor long and hard over this I think what we're aiming to do is to look at a number of images and, and therefore not get too bogged down but as we go through uh, I might uh, sort of suggest picking out a few specific uh, things that can be done. Now, th there's my feeling is that with this quite subdued light, and let's not forget we are looking at a raw file with minimal adjustment. It's in a standard profile. Yeah. If we go back to the, uh, we can see that it's in the phase one IQ three one hundred flash. And if we look at this briefly, we can see that that's the standard setting. There's something called flash art reproduction, which you were interested in earlier. Yeah. Um, it goes far too flat there, it does, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yes. Why doesn't it choose outdoor daylight as its default? I wonder. I think, I think we we looked at this previously. And we and found it doesn't look flash, as good, does the it? The flash was definitely more accurate and had a cleaner characteristic to it. And it's it's interesting on on the color ICC profile side of of Capture One that when you're in Lightroom, for instance, you get all the camera settings like camera landscape, camera portrait, camera neutral. Uh, and in Capture One we don't get that. I think when we looked at the Sony we had a, a generic standard and a stand no a generic profile and a standard profile and that was it. Right. So you get what you're given and work with it. Absolutely. So. It did seem to me that I had lost a little bit of contrast there somewhere. And I'm just wondering yep. if I had this quite often happens when you're doing this. Uh, let's just keep we can step back here and see if there's a maybe I didn't. Okay, this is where we're adjusting the highlight. Yeah, maybe just imagining it. But anyway, um, okay. Uh, I think that I just, uh, it's worth mentioning for those who are not familiar with Capture One, it has this potentially rather confusing drop down menus where you can apply any combination in any order that you want yeah. of uh, the adjustment controls that are available and they can be accessed by right clicking uh, to add or remove tool. Yes, so you can customize it any way you like. Exactly. Yeah, so I think for for people who are very confident and keen on their uh, post-production it's, it's actually a really nice tool. Can I ask a question about the whites in this picture? Because obviously there are some very pure whites in there and yet looking at the histogram you've got quite a lot of space on the right hand side. Um, Just here. And, and, yeah. and you know, it, it, some uh, People say when they're guys to processing, they should bring the black and the white point up, so that they're uh, so that they yep. clip the histogram. And obviously, in this case, you haven't. And I know this is a conscious choice, um, but do you ever use that logic of trying to bring the white point and black point up? Or is uh, it... Yes, with qualification. Yes, uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, I think when you think of uh, of Lightroom, it's dead easy because there's a white a white point a and a black point, point slider. Yeah. There isn't in Capture One, but what there is is there is a levels. Yeah, and there is a curve. Um, I think that the curve is the one I usually use. It does the same thing. The beauty of the curve is that there's both an RGB setting and there's a Luma setting. So if you want to increase, if you want to to clip the whites and increase contrast and saturation, you yeah. use the RGB. So let me just quickly illustrate that. Let's clip it deliberately it's by nice. putting the warning on. Yeah. So we can see where we are there 
And you can see the colour increasing as you do that in RGB dev. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think probably for this image that would be entirely appropriate, but if you, if you wanted to do the same thing with no change to colour, then Luma allows you to do that. Yeah. And actually that's a terrific tool, very yeah. nice. Uh, you know, basically it's as if it was doing it in luminosity. And those are I quite like the luminosity in there, it keeps that hazy feel to it. Let's, um, let's leave it in Luma for now, because I think what uh, another controller wanted to use, and I think this will allow us to target colours more accurately, is the colour editor. This can also be uh, the equivalent, really, of HSL in Lightroom. And what I'm going to do, in the advanced mode of colour editor, we can pick out uh, a specific colour channel. And if we think of the, uh, the, the light coming from the west yeah. and lighting these beautiful rocks in the foreground, it's that tone there. If I pick that tone, you can see it's a very, very unsaturated. Why unsaturated? Because yeah. the selection area shows you that it's very close to the center of the color wheel, which means that it's virtually no color there, or very little. But it does show you what the chromatic values are, and they are just sort of on the green side of yellow to the orange side of yellow with, in fact, it's quite a yellow tone. Now, yeah. in Capture One, you can extend that selection here with this little symbol, which allows you to take in all colors of that value. You have a hue control using smoothness, which is effectively a feather. So you, if you look over the edge of the color selection. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. There's a there's a standard one at about twenty, but I quite often go to quite often go to thirty, so it creates a very very soft edge to that selection. So you're picking all of those yellow colors throughout yes, the picture. Yes, absolutely. You can change the hue. So if you look at this, uh, sorry, I'm just using that with the cursor. Yeah. If you look at this box, yes. Yes. It, it shows you the direction of travel of the hue change. Yeah, so silver so, or warmer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So well, that's going to magenta, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And that's going to kind of. Green. green, definitely. Yeah. Um, and we'll leave it at where it was for now by double clicking the tab. Uh, and then there's also saturation and whoa, uh, lightness. So now you okay. can see though, obviously I haven't changed the hue yet. Yeah. Um, that that what that does is it introduces, as it were, it introduces light by lightening and increasing saturation, which is exactly what happens with sunlight. Yes. When sunlight emerges, and the beauty of doing it this way, where the sun is just dipped behind the cloud, is that you have this softness in the in the air, but you you have the uh, ability to, it's, it's gonna sound really fake, but I see it as something that you could see, uh, and in nature, you would see in nature. Hmm. Um, and, and often, let's say we, this sounds like an awful lot, doesn't it? Fifty percent of saturation. I presume fifty percent just means it's the middle point. Well, mm. yeah. Let's see where it goes to in total. Uh, Capture One is uh, quite different to Lightroom. Its yes. saturation is, is more powerful. It's more like Photoshop. Uh, I mean, what what you might want to do is to use that as your as your color hue reference. Now, to me, it looks too green. Yeah, there's definitely green tints in there that show up when you increase the saturation. So, should we just pull it towards? magenta you see how it's now going orangey yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and if you're after that warm light a little bit in that direction might help indeed you could also pull back because the greens on the cliff have become quite strong but we could pull that selection back which should take a little bit out of the greens in the cliff it's quite subtle but um and now if we come back to say 50 here yeah. on the saturation yeah yeah it's going to start looking quite normal again uh, we've still got the lightness up a little bit. I'll just see if we just pull that up and down. You can see the yeah, it is like the change. Yeah, it's just it's it's lighting control, mm. really. Uh, so for all you um, studio photographers out there, be familiar with that. And if we click it on and off, we can see That's that. Nice. Yeah. Can you see that that, that just looks into. flat? Yeah. That looks just partially lit yes i would say with uh, the sun just coming out it's and it's just as if the sun's just starting to emerge or through that very hazy cloud but it helps to bring for me the 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 question is does it help to bring the picture to life in the way that you you believe is consistent with well consistent with your perhaps your emotional response and or your in my case wishing to remain true to the eyewitness tradition hmm. so i'm not i'm not saying this 
that this moment is the exact reproduction of what the camera saw, but rather it's still a reasonably true, um, and well, that's without getting into discussions about the movement of the water, yes, yeah, um, yeah. which is another issue. Uh, but but for me, it's it's not a deliberate deception at any rate. Yeah. And and actually, you know what? Looking at that, I I would be quite happy to let let this one go at that point. Fabulous. That's in the background there. So, um, a detailed picture next. Moving on, uh, yeah, and I've got two versions, or not two versions, but two uh, interpretations of the same subject here. If I can select them both for viewing, and we'll just remove the browser to give ourselves a bit more space. Um, you can see the one on the left hasn't been, I don't think it's been edited at all. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is, uh, I don't know if you find this, but I find this a useful approach often when I'm uh, looking at a, a theme that has caught my eye uh, in nature um, and I, I will want to see it in context and if you look carefully at the left hand version you can see that it's quite an effort to compose the space so yeah. I've tried to use the, the sand the, exactly the negative space as a framing device the sand fortunately is quite even so um, it's, it's neutral almost like a neutral uh, spatial um, frame. Out of interest, would you say you work, tend to work more in that contextual um, mode typically? I know we've looked at another couple of pictures previously where you've mm. not gone into the close detail, you've, you've worked to try and include more about the story of where something sits, yeah, rather right. than abstracting it away. Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, gosh, it's really... I. I, I I, yeah, I don't want to put myself in a niche, yes, but I, no. I, I, I will readily admit that my natural inclination is to describe. Um, oh, I don't know. I've, I sort of I always w worry uh, that, that that's um, you know limiting. But you know, if you get to my age, you probably will accept that you are a certain way as a person. And my um, my interest in in you know, my love of nature um, is such that as a as an artist, I I love to 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 retain the relationship with nature in, in an accessible way. Perhaps so. For me, it is uh, it is a lot of it is about uh, feeling the. We just go to this one yeah. uh, on its own. Uh, a feeling being able to understand yes. Um, yes. the space and yet find it the, the the wonders, the visual wonders of geology in this case. Um, can speak within context. If we look at, uh, and I really, uh, so yes, I, I think, you know, in answer to your question, uh, yes, I do. But then there's also a part of me uh, that that probably feels I should be pushing my, um, my artistic inclinations more deeply into the abstract realm where there's perhaps more left to the imagination. Yes. Is this making yeah. sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Now, the problem with this, in this case, is that uh, it's, you can still see the sand, which is a kind of giveaway. You see yeah. that just at the bottom. It brings it back into. And yet, for me, it, it, well, it, it holds it in a kind of, it, it keeps that link. Well, maybe that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, but it's these two forms and their difference and their kind of relationship that makes the uh, the composition sort of of interest to me. I, I'm not going to say it works because, you know, perhaps there are, there's a lot of unresolved elements, but you know, as you do when you're composing an image, you're always trying to make the most of the elements as they are. So all of these incidental parts of this ab particular abstraction yes. are, you know, just the the edge of nature, it, and and this is an extraction, uh, um, a quoting out of context, as, as David would put it, yes. Yes. Uh, that that uh, perhaps allows the imagination to uh, work more easily. I mean, actually, I find this shape very figure-like. Yeah. Uh, for example, here, and this is clearly a kind of facial. Uh, well, to me, it seems clear that that that's going to look a little bit like a face. Yeah, we're very good at doing this paradelia, spotting um, humanistic or animalistic components. In I don't think we could not do it, can we? Well, we're I mean, programmed before it, aren't we? You would think that. Well, I think that, that you know my reading and my understanding of it is that human aesthetics are fundamentally based on that mm -hmm. um, instinct to seek out the uh, human and animal in 
uh, in the world around us. So that's what our aesthetic kind of ideas about brand balance and uh, flow proportion, particularly, let's say balance and proportion, yes. especially are, are deeply linked to our sense of the human face, the human figure, um, and our recognition of the animal kingdom. Anyway, that's that. Um, I have done a few adjustments, but I don't think this is a terribly interesting image to explore in that area. Let's just see it that. About the you see, we just there. vignetted yeah. it a little bit, yeah. darkened it down there with that layer. Um, and in fact, if we just show the mask on that layer like that. Yeah, so this is a vignette, but a selective vignette where you're, it is. Where you're taking a past. targeted vignette. Because if I, if we look at it too dark on the bottom left, just here, Definitely. for example, yes. yeah. Um, and then this ne next layer, uh, well, my guess is that's going to be a sharpening or clarity, clarity layer of some kind. Let's see if that's the case. It's interesting, isn't it? Yes. That, 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 that a broad, just normal vignette works only so far in most most cases. And when you are working to try and fine tune a picture, fine tuning that vignette tends to be uh, a big step in that. It's important. Um, kind Absolutely. of moderate it in some places and enhance it in others. Yeah, as as you can see, I've not used a vignette there, but uh, yeah. but actually your your point is a good one because quite often you use a little bit of vignette to maybe just build the light to, to where you want it to be, but then you need to be more specific to target the tones and to manage the light in a way that um, that suppresses some areas and and enhances others. Mm. So it can be quite a brutal tool, can't it, the vignette? It's arbitrary, ultimately. Yeah. I mean, the way that it maps is um, works well for some things, but it, it's arbitrary, isn't it? And uh, you know, we have we have the radial filter that allows a greater refinement of that, for yes. example, in Lightroom. Um, and a current version to Capture One, I, I will readily admit to having not changed to the latest version of Capture One on this laptop, but the um, latest version of Capture One also has a radial filter. Yes. So it's a kind of targeted vignette as well. Uh, but you can also then change it to inside or outside yeah. the that selection, and you can you've got so much control of the. But, of the feather. but essentially, when you get to the feathering some or feathering a vignette in this detail using the brush tools, pretty much the only thing you can do with it. Exactly. Okay, should we move yes, on? next. So next is a uh, a sort of a seascape. Murky uh, day. And, and very murky day. I, I thought I'd just put these two uh, together. Uh, to um, show you the original, which is on the right, or the original raw file with no adjustments, let's say. Yes. Um, now, uh, I think it's probably shot with a 70 millimeter lens. So on uh, phase one, that's a, a standard lens um, on a technical camera. And uh, there's no need for a lens cast calibration, therefore, fortunately. So just even the raw file is quite the color. The color balance is reasonably even across the frame you can see it's quite greeny yeah in its uh in its immediate form and that was something i i, I sometimes wonder is that is it that i've got a, uh, a real issue with green because i i think a lot of people might feel quite tolerant of that green um or is it what do you think i think there's a combination of two things there. i think i think the natural the natural phase color coloration tends to be slightly cyan and greeny um but i do think the sea in those conditions does have that it does have a greeny uh, tinge. Yeah. Actually, it still has a greeny tinge here as well. Um, and I, I hope I haven't overcorrected it. No, I just think sometimes as, a, as somebody who shot uh, Fuji film for, for nearly 20 years that, you know, I, I, I'm naturally a little bit more magenta biased. You yes, know? Yes. My whole color vision has been distorted by it. It is something. interesting when you look at some of the websites out there that, that have uh, a lot of landscape work on them, and, and especially American or uh, Australian, that's a complete generalisation, so I apologise apologize in advance. <laughs> but the magenta coloration or magenta tint seems to have taken over in many ways. So there's obviously an aesthetic, um, something nice about that, that magenta tint. And it, and it even moves on to mobile phones and, and iPads. When I've tried to profile uh, phones, and, phones and, and actually the Apple mm. uh, iMac, they yeah. all have a slight magenta tint against completely neutral. And, and strangely, ISO monitors have it the other way. ISO monitors have a slightly cyan greeny tint. D dare I say that, that rose-tinted spectacles is I think that's that. exactly <laughs> it, yes. Okay. The world always looks better through rose-tinted spectacles. Just, to, just, to, um, just to, to try to answer the accusation of, uh, of balance or, or question of balance here, um, you can see that the whites still re remain uh, quite 
greeny. Yes. I think at least yeah. on, on this laptop. Um, so, you know, looking for a, um, a, a feel of the, the green of the sea, um, I, I would think that ultimately colour, white balance is for most, uh, let's say, familiar scenes like, like I suppose this is if you're used to the sea, yeah. that, that balance is, it's it, while it's personal, it needs to be a balance between warm and cool and, um, and you know, in the case of the yellow and blue temperature slider, uh, and green and magenta in the tint slider. Um, and that's what I've tried to achieve here. Th this one has a few layers, um, and this is, as we know, the catch one layer I'll, system. I'll, I'll say briefly that yeah, like almost the greens in that look more, um, not impactful, I don't like that word, but they, they stand out a little bit more because they're not everywhere now. So they've been separated. They've been separated out, yeah. Uh, which um, I, I, I absolutely... or whatever we, we, we'd like to use. But, but in, in many ways, that's because our eyes adapt to pictures, don't they? If we, if we went straight from that green picture to this one, it looks very cool. All the greens have disappeared. But as we look at it for a while, our, our, our eyes adapt to the picture a little bit. And then we start to see the strong greens underneath the rock in the wave in the background. Indeed. Uh, just out of a matter of interest, I'm still in the background layer here. Just going to select that what you might call the the kind of uh, well it's the green that, that appears to yeah. be the one that we're looking at and we move the saturation up in it just to see how it, it changes you can see it spreads yeah. out into other areas of the image clearly um, but you could actually I think you would probably get away with a little bit of selective yeah. saturation there just to lift that sense now that's a that's a very clearly a personal interpretation yeah. but uh, on a, you know, one other thing that might be worth mentioning briefly, some of these changes that I'm doing here, these are relevant to a standard laptop. And I suspect that if you were to be seeing these on an industry quality monitor, they might look a little bit more saturated. Probably would do. Quite possibly, yeah. Um, um, so please, if you are looking at it, at this uh, video on such a, uh, uh, you know, forgive me if they're looking a little bit punchy, but... Um, Hopefully here we're we're looking. Most most people will probably be looking on them on iPads and uh, laptops and the like. Uh, they'll look about right. So you can see that the the Kelvin level is relatively cool. Um, and we'll go back to the layers. This is still in the background. So those were all the global adjustments so far. Yes. Uh, with in the exposure module, a little bit of brightness. And uh, if we go to uh, partly the sorry, partly the reason for that is that. Um, let me just go back one because I've made a bit of a hash of that. Um, do it again. Highlight that layer M, so you can see that the, my first layer is a darkening layer. Yeah. I often, often will do that. Now maybe I've slightly overdone it. If we look at the, I'm taking the contrast down. I'm actually thinking if we need to bring the contrast back a little bit, and because I've subdued it such a lot, and brightness back. And I don't know about you, but I often end up slightly overdoing it first time round. I just think that comes with the enthusiasm. Uh, so hopefully that should be a little bit more in keeping. And going back to what we were just saying about vignetting, in many ways this is this what you're doing is a vignette now, but but um, it won't have that radial effect. So it's not obvious at the bottom. It's more of a progression through the picture rather than. Yeah, that. absolutely. And I, I think I would say it's very definitely about depth. I and mean, you're, you're going to see in a second that uh, one of the one of the other layers, that one is that one is almost certainly bringing out shadow mm -hmm. detail. Uh, if we go up to layer three, it's yes. That yeah. that was the uh, that's also a vignette by the way. So if we look at that, yes. So yeah, uh, again. How natural that is, is, is clearly, I, I would acknowledge, debatable. Um, but I obviously felt it helped hold the sort of energy of the image. You can see, actually, without it, that the sky is still getting darker to the top. Now, if uh, I felt, as I feel slightly embarrassed looking at it now, it's a bit over, over the top, uh, a very quick way of reducing that is to take the opacity yeah, it's working like layers in Photoshop where yeah. you can just fine tune each. And just, and just tune it back a little bit. So, mm. yeah, I even know a lot of uh, Photoshop workers uh, will deliberately overcook an adjustment and then just use the opacity slider as a way of controlling it in the future rather than going back to the adjustments themselves yes. and, uh, and tweaking them. And layer four is that, and that's 
almost certainly clarity. Yes. Ah, that's to bring out the the, the texture, the skein of structure that, that's in the water there. Just to, and I think that's because I, you can see I focused it in on that area, um, and and that's because I think it helps to compete a little bit with the uh, with the lovely movement around the um, the the rock shelf here. Mm. And it enhances um, that diagonal leading towards a small island in the background. Yeah, so. I think we've already discussed and debated exposure times before haven't we so it's probably yes. not that <laughs> you're just going to take my word for it this is how i liked it having tested it how um, long was it have we got four seconds yes yeah, yeah. well it's that's quite interesting actually isn't it you'd think looking at that at that breaking wave that it might be a bit shorter, shorter than, than four that. seconds doesn't yeah. it yes but i suppose that just is how the how the light translates as it unfolds mm. over that period of time it's really interesting but I think that, that anything shorter, and you, you tended to end up with rather abrupt um, shapes. So, but you know, I, I I think that it's fair to say that if you want to capture a feeling of structure, you tend to need to be working within around uh, five to f five seconds to a fifteenth. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm at the longer end of that here. Should we move on? Yes. Yes. So I'll say right away, this is actually not Cornwall. Uh, but Devon, uh, close to where my mum lives, my mum lives in Exeter, so I, I still uh, in a dutiful uh, way uh, love paying her a visit. And before, before, after Bude and before Land's End, went back to see her. I do like to get out and have a walk every day and uh, there's a woodland, some woodland near to where she is where at that time of year it's just oh, absolutely lovely, it? choked with garlic. The it's sense quite of light, light in there is fantastic as well. It's been, it's been, uh, very deliberately interpreted high key, mm. I would say. We were talking about this, and I, I struggle with high key pictures, so I'm, I'm intrigued as what, to how you achieved it. Yeah, well, not sure. Uh, <laughs> should we see? Let's have a look at the background and the basic exposure. You can see there's a little bit of contrast in the heart snow. Um, I wonder if there's a no high dynamic range. Let's look at a curve. Yes, there is. So, in a Luma curve, I've taken a mid midpoint up somewhat. I do remember exposing it quite bright. Uh, let's just put the warning on. You can see there's a little bit of highlight clipping. Yeah. However, worth pointing out, highlight clipping starts to appear in Capture One at 248 in any of the three colours. Oh, no, colour ah, yeah, okay. So yeah. you could find, uh, if we went into one of these areas, and turn it off a second, they have got colour in them. I think there is a bit of colour. Yeah, yeah a bit so of colour. What have you got the values? Yeah, they're not clipping. 253, yeah. 252, 251. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's just it's just holding, as it were. Out of interest, can we look at the picture without the layers just to see how it started? We can. Uh, there might be a background. Um, yeah, but that's, yeah. that's yeah. your basic. So, so that's with the slight increase in contrast and a slight increase in luminance. So most of that high key is really natural there in the picture. This You've not forced it too much in any way. It's cloudy yeah. and I've given it a bright exposure. Yeah. I mean, you could expose yeah. it darker legitimately, but I was very, very keen to make sure that I had good shadow detail. Open in the shadows. Eh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, I think... So what do the light layers do? Here good right? point. Well, let's have yeah. a look. So this one... Um, sorry, I just uh, do this. And, ah, yeah. You know, so that's probably a darkening. Yeah. So this is so all this. Perhaps counterintuitively, that's a, a kind of side swipe vignette. Yes. Yeah. This layer is also a big. Some clarity in there. Oh, well, no, I beg your pardon. That one is a lightning one. You see that? So uh, okay. no, I'm sort of wondering, maybe I didn't need it there, but what I felt was looking, I remember that this, the foreground, quote unquote, twig mm -hmm. or slender branch here uh, was a bit, dom a bit dominant and that basically yeah. softens and lightens it. So that's almost contrast down yeah. there. So it's is all there just- clarity in there or is it just- uh, Minus clarity, down? let's have a look. I was thinking- Clarity. Yes, yeah, there is so the minus yeah. clarity. Okay. So I've taken out a little bit of the, de uh, the, yes, yeah, the structural the bite, uh, shape, yeah. the te the bite, the texture. Yeah, yeah, has been taken out with that one. Okay, and layer three uh, is uh, uh, putting a bit more light in that trunks in the background. Luminance. So that's yeah. that could well be minus clarity. It is so minus forty nine okay. clarity. So I'm put, trying to put air and space into the background. Yeah. 
um, to sort of have that be almost penetrating light or dissolving light as yeah. John Blakemore uh, so memorably phrased it as um, and, and you know what the other thing that I seem to remember I don't remember seeing a colour edit on this but I what I would possibly try to do oh, there is yeah there is and it's saturation down and it's in a yellow so um, oh, on those let's, leaves let's have a look at well no let's have a look at this trunk okay oh you know what I've turned it I off turn it off so that's oh, what I was trying okay. to do can you see that yeah it's taken the actual body of the trunk down and, and not the greens yeah I mean that's a hundred percent desaturation yeah. in a very 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 narrow channel of yellow um and that was what I was trying to do but it, it on off, I'd yeah. obviously turned it back on hadn't I so from there to there yeah it's affecting the, the trunk in the background it's affecting slightly as well right but I can, yeah I can see what you were trying to do yeah I you know I think if I was going to do that I'd probably have to target it to, in a layer to just those trunks and I think it's too much I'm probably looking you know that, that's a little bit unnatural isn't it that's just um, that's one, one of the beauties of Catch One is that you can target these colour adjustments in, in layers so you can brush them in which yeah. is a real weakness in Lightroom I think you know, that's true, but I think, to be fair to Lightroom, um, they've well, just introduced the range mask. Have you the, seen that? The range mask is just coming true. I, mean, yeah. I said this is... We'll, we'll have a look at that in the next yeah, video. Okay. Great. Okay, so that, that was that one. Uh, and then moving on, because I think we are sort of... Time is slipping away, as ever. Back to Land's... Or, I should say, return to Land's End uh, a year or so after my previous visit. Um, and here we have a fairly iconic... Sunset over Land's End yeah. kind of picture, um, but you know, with a, hopefully a little bit of a twist with this uh, very tight juxtaposition of the yeah on the on the side, yeah, just sort of kissing the edge of that rock, um, and and again, uh, a, well, this is a twenty second exposure, so that's a very very deliberate lengthening of the exposure, probably using a little stopper. Yeah, and this this is a sense of the long uh, as as the uh, the water is further and further away from you, you need to use longer and longer exposures to try and create that smoothing effect. Essentially, it's strange that, but you're right. Because if you get those little ripples, uh, which are so kind of dull to look at, dull mm -hmm. to the eye, um, they they can they can actually can, they're still very visible at one second uh, at, at times. Uh, the other reason for using a very long exposure with an image like this one is that the white foam which is a characteristic of you know not just Cornwall but particularly in Cornwall yeah. where there's a, a tremendous amount of, na of natural oils coming off the landscape through the river systems into the immediate um, coastal fringes uh, at this time of year yeah. and then when there's a bit of a swell or there's a churn then those natural oils form these foam foamy um, they're like uh, rafts of foam yes. that, that surround the uh, the coast, and uh, they're not unpleasant to look at, but they're very, they are very, uh, what's the word? They're very dominant if you, uh, in a photo. They can be quite sharp, can't they? Yeah, like they, they, they can. They can. They, they, they just, hold their structure. Where, whereas with the long exposure, they are softened, and uh, and and they they can sort of then become more easily. Um, I, th I think, well, essentially what I'm saying is that it allows the rock, uh, particularly the landscape, uh, to stand in, in stronger contrast against the fluidity and the, and the endless motion of the sea itself. Yeah. So we've got some bluebells in the next photograph? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, now this is, this is a spot that I've, I've been to and photographed before. It, it wasn't that... I, I took my, my group there, but... Um, I wasn't deliberately trying to recreate a composition I had shot before, but as it happened, I, I looked back to my ar archive from two years earlier, and indeed that this composition is almost identical. I mean, the, the camera was was not quite in exactly the same space, but it wasn't more than six inches mm. from where I had previously made the composition. And that's because you know, when you look at, at all the elements, um, these relationships are quite critical. The previous image actually been made from slightly higher, but the, the alignment was almost identical. Mm. That makes sense. And the position in three-dimensional space, 
falling backwards because of that thing. Now, did you come back to this the following day, I think, to remember you mentioning? I did, um, uh, and I'm not quite sure why it hasn't appeared. That's because we didn't mark it. So yeah, forgive me a second. Up. I'm going to look for that in the uh, unfiltered version so that we can mark it up. And so it's in the browser with... Oh, here we are. That's because we didn't do this and give it the same attribute. Yeah. So now if we go back to our filter, we can see it in situ and we can select them together uh, for a second because that allows us to yes. consider why um, in the end, this was the version that I worked on. Yes, yeah, so talk me through your thinking about revisiting and, and uh, why you were happy with the second. Well. Uh, for one thing, this this actually this composition for me, but it might look very straightforward, but it was quite a rule breaking composition, um, and so I, I I would have liked in an ideal world to have been able to have probably to have the rock tower surrounded by water, and well, let me just take you back a second uh, to uh, the just to illustrate how that concept might be understood because I had the previous day uh, also made this photograph um, and while I was desperately trying to make this work I just could not do so for various reasons specific to the rocks that surrounded um, these or the, the main as it were tower little tower formation here um, which is why I I continue to end up essentially with this. So um, to me, this one doesn't work. And and indeed I had another go uh, here uh, on that morning with a horizontal, Yeah. you know, can I make this work? But while I, I like aspects of this, but I don't like it so well as my, my final version. Uh, and so you'll have to just take it or at, at my word that for me, this this works, and um, and the, in the second one, there's no direct sunlight on there, and that direct sunlight plays a a role, doesn't it? In, in terms of so here's it absolutely, and 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 I should just say that this isn't fully developed yet. The the version on the right, on on the left, you can see what's good about the sunlight is that you get this lovely little kind of highlight appearing on uh, the rock tower, yeah, uh, and uh, and on the stones, and it does animate the stones. However, it also radically changes the colors and if we look highlight this one make sure that we see there's one a second um that there's a quite difficult well bluebells bluebells are notorious are they not yeah, in the uh, shadows they're looking very blue yeah as, as you can see just in here and, and down in a little gully um whereas in the sunlight they, they kind of become purple it's quite a I, I don't, by the way, believe that that's the wrong colour. No, um, no. It just doesn't, it just looks odd in, in, in context. Um, and also it becomes a little bit harsh. It sort of separates the sunlit zones from the shadow zones. And, and so, um, again, if we, we look at them together, there's, there's a unity uh, about this one that is quite pleasing uh, to me. Um, and so I have chose that actually as my uh, my put kind of portfolio image now I've already done a little bit of work I, I won't labor my way through all of the layers uh, on this one because it there's actually an awful lot that can be done you can see that I've already done yeah. several um, changes here and um, when I reviewed this the other day on my main monitor I found myself continuing to develop it yeah so I will just uh, look at these themes in a little bit more detail. By the way, this one, um, beg your pardon, the number five is an interesting one because without it, that trapped little bit of sea in there is such a vivid uh, cyan. Yeah. That is the colour yeah. of the sea yeah. in that part of the world. But I've, I've artificially made it the same or similar hue value to the sea back here yeah because then there's a continue continuity about it so if we can see them together yeah, obviously it's dark. It's dark. in yeah. fact i've not done it for a very good job of it because you can see there's a little bit of 
of, of that uh, very bright cyan in that zone it whoops in there um, let's just do this and change the brush density and size and then zoom back to that and I can just oh, yeah. correct that like yes. that and so that that's a that that's a, a correction which is a kind of false correction but because it looks right that way what one of the ways that I we might touch on in the next video but is the way that you can use the color editor to uh, locally affect tones to make them come forward or back um, and, and one thing I ended up doing uh, for my portfolio print was to subdue the tones of the cliff in the background which are actually really quite interesting color wise yeah um, but they fight with the rock tower when you say something in the tones it's the luminosity or the, or the color both tones. the luminosity and saturation okay, yeah so but that was a lot of work um, but the way it, way it worked was you can target this and, and in the end it took me about half an hour uh, to do it so it would be the, the length of one of these videos and more so I'm not going to do it um, taking the reds uh, yeah. particularly and uh, darkening them down reducing the contrast uh, and so you're subduing the overall texture and subduing the colour and subduing the luminance and but you do it in a very subtle way so that the, the net result is that the tower, which I, I also then slightly lightened, yeah. uh, just at that leading edge, and slightly increase the saturation. Try and correct to more three-dimensional depth. More three-dimensional, yeah. more depth. You have to do it in a way that that is believable. Yes. I also, you see where that, there's uh, just at the top yes. of the sky here, yeah. um, there's a little cloud. I used a little, let's see if I can do that. That should be easy to do. Take a, another layer and I actually used a gradient mask it's a little bit easier with the new version of Capture One uh, but you put a little if I just look at the mask you know it's quite difficult to draw with the old the old mask is different it's trying to get the angle right yeah exactly um, and then it, it's uh, whoops yeah see I don't want to do that yeah don't want to do it like that I wanted to do it like probably that's a bit softer. Yeah. Now the idea is just that it's a little bit eye-catching is all. So with turning the mask off, I'm just going to move the brightness up a little bit. Yeah, I can see that. You see that? Yeah. And it's just, all it's doing is just softening it. And it's so that it becomes integrated into the rest of the sky without being eye-catching. So off, on, yes. very, very simple. Yeah tiny things here but you know I think everything is an accumulation of fine details uh, in landscape both the observation of the landscape itself and the adjustments that you make in post-production that's quite a radical composition on this one yeah I mean this is like well it's daylight there's no clouds in the sky what are you gonna do yeah. you know it's, oh, it's difficult um, you can see I've cropped it which I don't do very often should we go through the crop yeah I, I, to be fair I, I suggested the crop on that one yeah you did, you did. Um, I can see that in the original, uh, you know, the slope and the proportions I'm reasonably happy with. And you can also see that this little group of bluebells here is quite pleasing. Yeah. Um, but I think that what we were speculating on was that this area of the image is, is quite non-productive yeah. in a way, whereas the crop helps it to serve a purpose on the other hand it also slices it cuts, the cuts through that like blue bells, yeah. is why it's always best to do these things on location if possible which yeah probably wasn't possible there but i yeah. love i do love the way you've balanced those two because like many a time i've tried to do this sort of thing and it's very difficult to make work it is yeah yeah well thanks and um, you've used movements as well with the focus here yeah so this is a technical camera um in in use and, and I, I think it illustrates its value it's quite hard to visualize it I don't know, there used to be in Capture One something called a focus mask. Okay, yeah. I'm going to turn it on. Uh, can you see how that works? Yes. So the greens are basically mapping the areas that are showing sharp detail according to, to Capture One. It's a yeah. bit of a blunt instrument. Let's just turn it off a second. Um, and if we look at these bluebells, I would say these bluebells would be a definite target for me. Now, there might be a little bit of wind movement in here. Yeah. But you can see where they're not moving it's pretty crisp um, fortunately that also coincided with this edge of the rock and 
and if we move out to here to the uh, the mine mine buildings and I probably used F16 as well uh, sometimes it's recorded in the metadata well no I didn't uh, but you can record it now in the metadata of the uh, electronic shutter you, do you do that yourself or does it do all you have to do it yourself yeah. yeah but anyway what it was done uh, the way it's done is with swing yes. which is tilt on its side if you're a, somebody who's interested in that kind of thing um, and and there it's done a, it's done a pretty good job I said yeah um, okay a, a sunset yes finally uh, and it's the same picture but I've included the original raw file here uh, to uh, just illustrate what I was trying to do briefly so the original is here we'll just uh, quickly go to that um, another day with no clouds I mean you know Cornwall what can you do it's uh, it's virtually tropical as far as I'm concerned <laughs> um, you know you do get days like that especially that time of year uh, so e deliberately excluding the sky uh, trying to make an image that utilizes the power of the sun uh, so shooting directly into the light it's quite a, quite an interesting one you had to use a graduated filter to control the highlights you can see the highlights are pretty bright yeah. in here but just about holding up um, so that's the original and then the uh, the worked on version we can see them together it's quite a bit cooler yeah uh, and you might think that's a bit counterintuitive in a way isn't it but but the coolness the idea really is that the coolness helps to separate the colors and and you see the warmth of the, the sunlight uh, against the, the relatively cool shadows yeah. uh, and that gives more depth. Yeah, so the co colour contrast creates intensity. Yeah, even though in other respects there's less intensity because the, the overall contrast is down Yeah, uh, and that looks like that's been done more locally than globally. I mean, increase the saturation, clearly taking the white balance back towards blue. Yeah. I'm sure we'll Which see. Will neutralise a lot of the. Um, yeah, if we were to saturation. Yeah, fifty. So that one's fifty-one sixty, as against fifty-eight sixty-four. Yeah. Uh, there's a slight tint change as well. Believe it or not, that one's actually greener. Um, but that's so much more yellow. That's the overwhelming theme there. Uh, so, and and then locally, I have softened the light here. I also think there's one other important change which we should look at. Uh, and that is probably that this one uses that profile and oh no I'm, I thought for a moment I used the linear yeah, oh yeah I have I beg your pardon absolutely so if we look at that it's on the auto curve which is a quite a gentle film based profile yeah linear response is a completely flat line to the raw file yeah so it doesn't do um, in very low contrast very low contrast and then you, what I usually do is build up the contrast using, using layers brushes and layers yes, yes. exactly yeah. exactly and uh, you can see the beauty of well in fact it doesn't really make that much difference but um, there's probably a little bit better put this blue into the into the water uh, yeah contrast there yeah and it, it's it, overall this is actually a little bit lower contrast yeah um, I have to say the highlights, if they're clipped, are probably clipped not that differently in both. Yeah. So, so that's, that's worth noting. And and again, you can see there's plenty of colour tone surrounding the, the, the burned out areas. That should be... If we look up at our clipping, mm -hmm. uh, which, sorry, just the cursor will illustrate it there, uh, you can see that even in that very, very bright it's thing, it's very, yeah, still a tiny bit of colour in yeah. it. Okay, so that's that. And I think, timing-wise, that's probably bringing us to the end of the edition. Well, thank you very much for that, Joe. You're welcome.